study or our message this morning is entitled Christian Runners. Christian Runners. And uh, we're not talking about a race. We're not talking about the uh, Olympics or Christians who participate in that. But we're looking at Christian Runners, a story in the Bible that actually has a lot of relevant details for us today. A story that has a lot of parallels. It's actually uh, a story that's very short in the scriptures and despite its shortness it is incredibly popular and also not just for good reasons it's popular because a lot of skeptics and unbelievers use this story as one of the key points to discredit the Bible. The short story I'm talking about is said to be more of a legend and a myth rather than an actual event that occurred. Anyone want to hazard a guess? Popular story with the little ones. It's the story of Jonah. The story of Jonah, four chapters in the Bible, very brief, and yet is very popular. You'll find it in almost every children's book because it has some outstanding details. You know, a big fish swallows a man overboard and throws him out. Amazing details that don't happen in every story. And because of those very details, Many skeptics actually discredit the story of Jonah as pure myth fiction. They actually say science says that no man can survive inside a whale. So this is obviously some kind of a fairy tale of some biblical proportion. Now it's interesting because we have to remember that also science doesn't, uh, or says, science rather says it's impossible for a human being to be made from the rib of someone else, right? As God did with Adam and Eve, in particular Eve. So the story of Jonah is not about a physical circumstance that just occurred. It's a miracle that was involved. And trying to explain it scientifically or how things might happen or not happen and discredit it that way, that's not really the point of it whatsoever. What happened there was actually impossible naturally. It was a miracle. And there are lessons there that we want to look at and see what we can learn together as we examine this story. It's, uh, as I said, a fairly brief story, four chapters but full of lessons, and maybe lessons that we don't necessarily think of. You see, the practical lessons in this story focus or hinge on two key factors. Two key factors in the story of Jonah. And the two key factors are God's character and when believers turn from God. These are the two key factors. All the other details in the story are like a backdrop or a framework where the story is placed. And sometimes we get caught up in the details. That's what's popular, you know, in the children's story I read for the girls. And story, uh, Jonah's story is illustrated. The main scene in the story is usually Jonah being thrown over and the fish swallowing him, right? Uh, that's not what the story was about. This is just an incidental detail in the story. It's not what the story is really about. Interestingly enough, there has been in history, over time, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but there are stories in history of people who have been swallowed by a whale who have survived. Now these stories don't prove to us therefore the story of Jonah happened because these stories sometimes are questionable as to whether they actually happened or not. But they do exist and uh, sometimes people use them as the evidence to prove there you go a man can survive in the belly of a whale so Jonah was true. The point of Jonah's story like I said is that it is supernatural. It's not just a naturally occurring phen phenomenon. So whether these stories are true or not doesn't really have much bearing on proving or disproving what happened in the story of Jonah. So I want to look at some of these lessons that are relevant and practical for us today. Uh, I want to highlight the key details of the story. God gives Jonah an instruction to go and preach to Nineveh. Jonah runs away, finds a ship going to Tarshish, gets on the ship. A big storm erupts. Jonah is asleep in the ship. The sailors are all afraid for their life. They go wake up Jonah. Jonah says, uh, after casting lots, of course, they find it's Jonah. They, uh, Jonah says, this is all because of me. Throw me overboard. So they do. The big fish, most likely a whale. Not a detail. Some people get really caught up in the detail of that. They say, well, it says a big fish, not a whale. Not, not the, really the point of the story. Uh, Jonah is swallowed. And uh, after three days, he prays to God there in the, from the belly of the whale. And uh, God commands the, uh, the, the, the fish or the whale to go throw him up uh, on the shore. He goes to Nineveh. He preaches. And lo and behold, the city of Nineveh repents. 
They're not destroyed. Jonah sits outside the city waiting for the destruction to happen. Doesn't happen. He's displeased and the sun is hot and there is a little, uh, you know, plant that grows and then a worm comes and eats the gourd and God has this discussion with Jonah where God is trying to teach Jonah something about himself. This is really the, the, the details. I've summarized it uh, to save us the time of reading it, but you can read it in your own time to refresh the details afterwards if you wish. But there are some very practical, relevant lessons for us today. Because the most amazing thing that we meet in the story of Jonah, the first thing that happens is here is a prophet of God receiving a very clear, divine directive and mission. He turns around and runs in total rebellion. Which seems utterly absurd, right? Like, what, what, John, what's wrong with you? God told you go do this. He turns in the opposite direction and he will not go and do it. A prophet of God, no less. Let's read it. This is how it starts. It's rather abrupt, but we'll, uh, we'll pick some highlights in the story to just make reference to Jonah chapter 1. So if you have your Bibles, we'll turn to Jonah chapter 1. We'll read a few verses here and just make some comments and see what we can learn. Jonah chapter 1, beginning with verse 1. We'll read the first three verses. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, and went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid a fare, the fare thereof, and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Very abrupt beginning, right? There isn't really even an explanation given as to why Jonah does what he does. He receives an instruction very clear. He goes the opposite direction. In total rebellion, disobedience, and disregard. Running from God's call. Now, if you've ever wondered what got into Jonah's mind to do that, you're not the only one. I've wondered that, and I'm sure you might have at one point or another. And I find it amazing that there is no explanation given here as to why or what possessed Jonah or what got into his head to do this thing. But the first lesson I want to I look at from this is running from God's will and direction is always a step down. It's interesting how many downs are recorded here. Jonah goes down to Joppa. He finds a ship, he goes down into the ship, and then later on, he goes down in the belly of the whale. Running from God is always a step in the downward direction. It goes down and down and down. He went down in the sea, he went down in the belly of the whale, and that's when he finally realized something. So, turning away from God's will and calling takes you down and not up. That's lesson number one. That's pretty obvious, but I want to challenge each and every one of us here today with this question. Have you ever been like Jonah? Knowing the right thing to do, the right place to be, and you do the exact opposite. Exact opposite. 180 degrees. If you look at the map, apparently, you know, Tarshish is in the exact opposite direction to Nineveh. Nineveh is this way. He goes this way. How many times have you been like Jonah. Whatever the reason you might have to justify such a thing, when that happens, you're always moving down. When you move away from God's instruction, from God's direction, and from God's calling. Later on, we will look at why Jonah ran away. We will come to that soon enough, but that's lesson number one. Rounding from God is going down. Not only that, but uh, the next lesson that's closely associated with that, we see in the story as it unfolds and the details, is that when we turn our back on God, we not only go down, but we impact others around us, and we impact them negatively. These sailors, these poor sailors, who happened to pick up Jonah, found themselves in a big mess because of what Jonah had done. They didn't do anything, right? They were happy on their way trading or doing business, whatever it might have been. But because of Jonah's decision, not only did he go down, but he brought others down with him. He distressed them. He caused their life to be in peril. He ne negatively impacted those that were around him, those that were associated with him. They were terrified for their lives, right? As a matter of fact, they went down and found him asleep and they were shocked. They said, wake up and pray to your God. Don't you realize we're about to die? So, having to wake him up was an interesting detail as well, because not only does running away 
bring us down. Not only does it impact those around us negatively, but it causes us to be in a state of or causes us to be in a stupor. Jonah was asleep in the midst of a raging storm that threatened their lives. And everybody was aware of it except for Jonah. Isn't that interesting? So not only do we go down, we impact others negatively, but also our sense of, and of awareness of what is going on is so diminished, Jonah was sleeping in the middle of a storm. He had to be actually woken up by those that were present. Sometimes a friend or a family member might see what's happening with us and try to wake us up from our slumber, from our path of disobedience or our path of rebellion, where we can be so far gone that we don't recognize the signs along the way that God is trying to wake us up with. We fall, we fall asleep through them. We just cruise through them, not recognizing them. And they negatively might impact those around us and they try and wake us up. That's what happened in the story of Jonah. So they woke him up. So the question here again to you is this. What are you doing? You see, Jonah's behavior did not match the circumstances that surrounded him. There was a dangerous storm. He was fast asleep. What caused him to be in that circumstance was his rebellion in going against what God had told him to do. So how is it with you today? What are you doing? Are you really awake to the circumstance around you and your behavior matches the circumstances? Or are you like Jonah, fast asleep in the belly of a way, uh, in the belly of the fish this time, uh, sorry, the belly of the ship. He's not out of the ship just yet. He's fast asleep down on the bottom of the ship. Not aware of what is happening. Do you recognize when others, loved ones, those who are in your sphere of influence, come to wake you up to realize what is really going on. Do you recognize that or do you sleep right through it, snoozing them away? I snoozed my alarm away this morning. I was fast asleep. My alarm woke me up to the reality of the circumstances that time is passing. And in a half sleepy state, I snoozed it away. An hour later, I woke up with a bit of a shock. Oh, it's that late already. Small example, but it can be a lot more fearful and serious. In a life circumstance where you don't recognize what is really going on, are you really awake? Do you recognize the waking signs that God sends your way? It might be through friends, through loved ones. It might be through a sermon like this one this morning even. You never really know. How is it with you? How is it with me? But the story is not finished. Next lesson I want to look at is the beautiful revelation of God's character. God did not forsake or abandon Jonah, despite his outrageous, rebellious act. God actually revealed something about his character. There's something about God's character in this story that can either be misunderstood or even abused. And the beautiful thing is this, even though we might find ourselves like Jonah, disobedient, on a path contrary to God's will, God does not give up on us. The circumstances that happened to Jonah were designed to wake him up and alert him to the gravity of his situation. God didn't say, okay, Jonah, well, that's it. See you later. He actually did not abandon Jonah. It's interesting that Jonah had some sense of realization that what was happening was because of what he did. Isn't that right? He told them, listen, what's happening here, all this storm is because of me. And yet his... his uh, semi-wakefulness to what was happening did not prompt him to do the right thing. He was actually plunged into despair because he wanted them to throw him over the ship for the purpose of dying. What would happen to someone if he got thrown over the ship in a big storm? To all human perspective and understanding, that is definite and certain. Death. He thought, well, maybe I'll relieve these sailors. Maybe the storm will stop if I just die. If I'm, if I'm dead, God will be happy and just leave me alone. Just throw me out of the ship, guys. It'll all be okay. This was Jonah's mindset. So he woke up to the situation, but did not do what was right. He actually plunged into a deeper despair and he had this suicidal mindset. If I die, all will be well. Sometimes we might have moments like that. We might recognize and realize the hurt and pain that our 
course is causing others around us. We might catch a glimpse of it when we're woken up, but the danger is we try and fix it in the wrong way, just like Jonah. We try and run further and seek to hide more. That's what Jonah thought. I'll just hide in the bottom of the sea. If the ship is not enough, I'll just, I'll just hide in death. Forget it. Let me die. Now, the idea that Jonah suggested was rather outrageous to the sailors because they didn't say, great idea, and they did it straight away. They said, no. And they started offloading the ship of all the baggage and excess weight and whatever goods they were trading in, and that didn't work. Finally, after at their, their wit's end, they decided to say, okay, fine, we, we might just have to do what Jonah said. This is the danger for us as well. You see, Jonah thought his fate would be better drowning in the sea than praying and turning to God. Isn't that interesting? He could have prayed in the ship. He didn't think to pray in the ship. He thought, I'd rather die. How is it with you? How is it with me? When we turn from God, when we're woken by circumstances or friends or some situation that happens, do we actually plunge deeper and run further and still avoid doing the right thing? Or do we recognize and realize what's happening? The beautiful thing about it is, no matter where you are, in your journey of going contrary to what God said, God does not abandon you. He didn't abandon Jonah. What was happening there was actually God's plan. You see, God surprised Jonah by his relentless, uh, you know, he was pursuing him relentlessly. Jonah did not expect that there would be something like a big fish that would swallow him when he would hop in the water or when he would be thrown in the water. That was totally unexpected. Totally not in the script as far as he was concerned. The, the sailors didn't expect, no one expected that whatsoever. And so this is something about God's character. God will use unexpected ways and means to reach you when you are running away. Amazing, unexpected, out of the ordinary ways and means can develop and happen in an attempt for God to wake you up and save you from further destruction. This is the character of God that is revealed in the story. The question is, will you recognize that when it happens? You see, at one point, Jonah finally recognized and realized and actually prayed and asked God to help him and realize that God was with him. But he did that after he was stuck in the belly of the whale for three days. Now, I just want to say quickly here, because I'm saying big fish and belly of the whale interchangeably. The only big fishes that, or the kind of big fish that we're familiar with in this day and age are what we call whales. Okay, so I know what the text says, says I know what the passage says, because I know some people are very, I've had discussions with people, very meticulous about, no, it doesn't say whale, it says big fish. Okay, so when I say whale, I'm referring to the big fish that's referred to there. It's a detail, it's not the point of the story. Whatever it was, it was a big creature, bigger than Jonah, that swims in the sea. Whales are basically the most likely one. Okay, that's just the, the point as far as that's concerned. Rada, you want to say something? It's confirmed in Matthew twelve forty. Yes, that's true as well, uh, <coughs> depending which, what the original is and what translation it was. But that's exactly the thing. It was a large creature, what we would understand to be a whale. So God may bring you, like Jonah, to a situation where you are stuck in order to reach you and wake you up fully to what you need. You see, Jonah had nowhere else to go after he was stuck in the belly of the whale. That's it. There's no more throwing overboard. He was literally stuck. He's not dead, but he's as good as dead, right? And so he recognized that the only way out for him now was to pray and to seek God and to do what God desired for him to do. So, do you recognize the situations? Do you have to wait until God puts you in a situation where you are totally stuck with no way out until you wake up and realize what you need to do? Or can you recognize that sooner? What are we like? Are we like Jonah? There are many lessons in the story of Jonah. The next one is another beautiful one that's closely associated with God not giving up on Jonah. Is that God gave Jonah a second chance, right? Now God is the God of second chance, but not just second chance, thankfully. Third and fourth and many other chances as well. It's part of God's character. He does not give up easily. We can read that because in Jonah chapter 3, I find this very interesting, almost repeat of what happened in chapter 1 recorded. Jonah chapter 3, notice how this is recorded for us. 
Jonah chapter 3 and verse 3. We'll, we'll read the first three verses as well. Jonah 3 and verse, sorry, verse 1 down to 3. Pardon me. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. So here's the second chance, right? Second time saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah rose and went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. I find that really amazing. God doesn't change uh, the message or anything. He tells Jonah, okay, Jonah, now that we've uh, gone through this detour, now you're ready. To go and preach what I already told you before. Remember when you ran away and didn't want to do it? Go do that one again. The same thing. And Jonah actually goes. So God gave Jonah a second chance. You might be running. You might be hiding from God. You might be on a particular part of your journey that is not in harmony with God's will and desire. But you know that God does not give up on you. God is the God of second chances. We see that very clearly in the beginning of the history of mankind. When Adam and Eve fell, God gave mankind a second chance. He didn't say, well, you disobeyed, that's it, it's gone. God does not give up on us e easily. Others might give up on you. Even you might give up on yourself. You might think you're too far gone. But God does not give up easily. You might think it's so far gone that the only option left is for you to die. Like Jonah thought, just throw me over the boat out into the sea and all will be well. I will die and all will be well. Don't give up. God does not give up on you. That's the key here. God is the God of second, third, and fourth chances. So, this is God's character. You know, God still used Jonah to accomplish his will. God didn't say to Jonah, Okay, Jonah, all right, you've learned your lesson. I'm going to go find another prophet to do this because obviously you're not good at this job and I don't want to risk, you know, you messing it up again. God didn't do that. He actually chose Jonah, who rebelled, who disobeyed the first time, and gave him the exact, exact same mission to go and carry out again. God's forgiveness, when you blow it, is complete. His acceptance and reinstatement is complete. That's what we learn from this story. God does not give up, and God desires to forgive and to use you to carry out His will, and accomplish his purpose. I find it also interesting that after all this running and trying and this whole adventure in the sea and with the whale, that Jonah still ended up doing God's will in the end. Despite his disobedience, his you know, detailed escape plan and all these things, at the end of the day, Jonah still carried out and fulfilled God's will. He just did it by taking a very long and tiresome detour, right? You know, with the little girls, we have two girls, so uh, sometimes we have situations where they don't want to do something. And I'll sometimes ask them the question that you're very familiar with. We can do this the easy way or the hard way. Your choice, but it's going to get done. And the easy way is if they obey willingly and quickly and get it done. Or the hard way is they will have some consequences and some lessons to learn along the way. And still end up doing what is asked of them to do. This is a lesson for them to learn about obedience. Okay, this is what was happening in the story of Jonah. Jonah took the hard way. He ended up doing and carrying out God's will. So the question to you and me in light of this part of the story is, how are you fulfilling God's will? The easy way or the hard way? Because if you go in the hard way, you will have some knocks and bangs and lessons to learn that are not the most pleasant in experiencing them. I assure you, Jonah did not have a pleasant, joyful, happy time when he was running away from God, being thrown into the sea, fearing for his life, expecting to die, not knowing what in the world happened when he something swallowed him, some, all of a sudden he's somewhere, he doesn't even know where, what's going on. These were not happy, pleasant, joyful adventures for Jonah. That was a hard way. How is it with you? How is it with me? In the process of running away from God, we find the hard way. Even though God gives us a second chance and accepts us, we can hurt ourselves and others around us by choosing to go about it in the rebellious, disobedient way. And still come around in the end and fulfill God's will and God's plan. But it's very 
very different. So if I was to ask you to take out your spiritual GPS and check on your spiritual progress, <coughs> where are you today on your journey? Are you on the detour, the hard way, or are you doing it God's way? The story of Jonah teaches us that very, very clearly. And do you recognize the chance after chance that God is using to call you to not just fulfill His will, but to have the joy and the blessing that comes along with it? You see, Jonah missed out to a large degree on the joy and the blessing that comes from fulfilling God's will. He still fulfilled God's will, but the joy and the blessing to a large degree he did not experience, as we shall see. And we will see why. You see, if God has to lock you up or put you in a corner to wake you up, we have to recognize that God will do that. He will not abandon you. He will do that every chance, every time you get, if, that will, if that's what it will take to wake you up. But the risk and the danger is this, brothers and sisters. Life is very uncertain. Life is very uncertain. Just this week, you know, there's all this talk about this uh, new coronavirus happening. And people getting infected. And people are dying. Then people are freaking out because they don't want to die as well. The uncertainty of life. This week an earthquake happened. I think it was in Turkey. And people without any expectation or any preparation died like that. Destroyed in an earthquake. There was even a famous basketball player this week. I don't know if you heard the story. Helicopter crashed. He died with his baby girl. 13 year old. He did not know that that would happen when he got on the helicopter. Life is uncertain. Are you taking a risk unnecessarily? Taking a chance? Waiting that, well, God won't give up on me. I'll have another chance somehow along the way. And I'll turn eventually. Remember, life is uncertain. Now, I'm not saying this to scare you. But I'm saying this to wake you up. Amen. This is reality. And God is a God of love and mercy and forgiveness. So if you take the detour route, there is grave and serious risk. The next lesson I want to look at as well in this story <coughs> is that Jonah knew better than to run. Not a good idea. We can all agree with that. Anyone who would read that story would say what Jonah did was a very foolish thing. Not smart. Even though we might engage in similar things, maybe not as outrightly, not maybe as, as outrageously or blatantly, but when Jonah was running from God, he still considered himself a worshiper of God. Let's look at this in Jonah chapter 1. Very interesting detail here, and this brings us to another point of conflict. Jonah chapter 1, verse 9 and 10. While Jonah was running, while he was in his path of disobedience and rebellion, notice how he referred to himself when he was asked by the, Hebrew, by the sailors to tell them his story. Verse 9 of chapter 1, And he said unto them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which hath made the sea and the dry land. Then were the men exceedingly afraid, and said unto him, Why hast thou, why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them. Do you notice a contradiction here? Jonah tells them, I worship the God of heaven. I ran away from the God I worship. You see a conflict? Very serious conflict. He says, I'm a worshiper of the true God. Yeah, I ran from him in this one instruction, but I'm still a believer and a worshiper of the true God. Are you like Jonah? Do you see what I'm saying when it comes to this particular point? You see, it was just in this request that Jonah did not agree with God. He had other plans, but he still considered that he was a good believer, a good worshiper of God. Do we do that at times? We believe and obey God in most things, but in one or two things, we do our own thing. Thinking we are still good Christians, right? That's what we learn from this particular point. Maybe in one area we run from God, we keep Him away, and we end up deceiving ourselves and having this conflict this contradiction in our experience where our actions and our profession do not match 
And it doesn't mean you are in total outright rebellion in everything. It could be like Jonah in this one thing. You see, Jonah was a worshiper of God in every other aspect, right? He believed God, understood the truth and all these things. It just came to this one particular mission that Jonah thought, well, I, I don't want to do that one, but all the others I do, Lord. So I'm still a worshiper of the true God. Do you keep God out of one area of your life? Do you do your own will? Carry out your own desires and wishes in one area of your life. And all the other things, you come to church, you sing hymns, you dress up for Sabbath, you believe the truth, you have fellowship, bring food to the lunch as well, all great, good things. You know, you're a believer, a Christian. Just this one area, maybe your finances, maybe your work, maybe your relationships, maybe whatever it might be. You just run things your own way. Beware of that deception. Jonah did just that. In his escape, in the ship, he still claimed to be a worshiper of God and one that feared and worshipped God. Interesting, right? Running away from God. Keeping him at a distance from whatever part of your life. Are you doing that or not? You see, we might be Christians, we might come to church, we might do all these things, yet your heart might be far removed from God if you're honest. That's very, very possible that's a very real thing remember just like God saw Jonah far away in the ship lost maybe to, to sight maybe they were out away from land and everywhere God sees everything he knows exactly what you're doing he knows exactly where your heart is at and he's not angry with you and gonna lash out at you he is doing his best to reach you and bring you back so that you can be completely joyful in his will and in his presence because the path of disobedience and rebellion is hard even if it's only in one area of your life that's what we see in the story of jonah jonah was a prophet of god not just a regular person you know a member or whatever he was a prophet of god and he found himself by his choice and actions in this circumstance far removed from where god wanted him so, God knows where you are, God knows where your heart is at, and the amazing thing is, you might fool others around you, you might even get so good as to fool yourself into thinking that all is well, but you cannot fool God. He sees where you're at, and He actually loves you, and His desire is for you to repent and receive His forgiveness. God's heart is revealed towards Jonah. In the same way that his heart was towards the Ninevites. The interesting thing is, the book of Jonah, where the story of the conversion of the city of Nineveh and their repentance, that is actually not the focus and the main point of the story of Jonah. You realize that? That happens to be part of the backdrop and context in which what, this is what was happening. What was happening in Nineveh on a large scale, where they were rebellious against God and God wanted to reach them, to bring them back to Him, was actually what was happening in Jonah's heart as well on an individual scale. You realize that? And this is what this story teaches us. So, God's heart towards Jonah was not to abandon him, despite Jonah running away, and despite Jonah disobeying in just one area, in one command only. Now, I want to look at why Jonah did this, because this helps us understand the circumstance and the reality of what was happening in his heart a little bit better. Why did Jonah actually run away from this clear, direct mission? Now, chances are, if, if God told you to do something, and you knew it was God very clearly, and you were a worshiper of God, chances are you would not so blatantly disobey well, one would hope so anyway, right? But Jonah did. Why? The question I want to pose here and, and uh, think about, why did Jonah do that? Why did Jonah run away? It has to do with God's character. You see, the real problem in the story is not that Jonah ran away. Jonah running away was a symptom of a deeper problem. What is this deeper problem that manifested itself in him running away? What was the cause? What drove his thinking for him to run away? It's actually quite amazing because it's not recorded. 
in the beginning of the book, as I said. It seems unreasonable, seems absurd. A prophet of God given a mission and so blatantly and brazenly goes contrary to God's will. It seems outrageous. An explanation is given, not in the beginning of the book, as I said, but at the end of the book. Let's go to Jonah chapter 4 and read this passage and see what Jonah's mindset and Jonah's heart was like to help us understand the reason why he ran away. Jonah 4, and again, we'll read the first three verses. Now pay careful attention here because this is quite telling. Jonah preaches to the city in chapter 3, they repent, right? So Jonah chapter 4 begins with the following in verse 1, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly and he was very angry. What's he angry at? What just happened in the previous chapter, which is the repentance of the people of the city of Nineveh. He is very angry at that. Surprising. Now notice what happens, and this gives us an insight into the beginning of the story. Verse 2, And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying, when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God, and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. You see what's happening here? Jonah was angry because things did not go the way he wanted. Here's the thing, and Jonah here indicates that there was some kind of a response that happened at the beginning of the story. And he says to God, see, see what happened? I knew this would happen. That's what I told you when I was back home. That's why I went to Tarshish. Here's the reason that Jonah ran away. I don't know if you picked up on it or not. The reason he didn't want to go is that Jonah hated the, he the heathen, evil people of Nineveh. And he felt that they were so evil, they deserved to die. And he knew that if they repented, God was loving and merciful and compassionate, that he would just forgive them. And Jonah did not want that to happen because it was not according to what he felt was just and right and what these people deserved. You see that in the verse? He basically is telling God, I knew you forgive them. I told you you would do this. See, let me die now. Let me see. They repented and you forgave them and they weren't destroyed. I told you. That's why I ran to Tarshish. That's what he's saying, right? Now that sounds rather outrageous to us, right? But listen, Jonah felt that this was the just thing. These were heathen, evil idolaters who knew nothing of God and didn't worship God. And they justly deserved death. So here we see Jonah's sense of justice did not match up, or rather, let me put it this way. God's character and benevolent mercy did not conform to Jonah's sense of justice. And he said, no, I do not want that to happen to them. I would rather go to Tarshish and die myself. And so when they repented at his preaching, and it's interesting, when we look at some other component of their repentance now, when they repented, he got angry. And he told God, I told you, I, I knew this would happen. I know you, you're merciful, loving and kind. I know you, I knew you'd forgive them. You're telling me about Nineveh and they're on your mind that they're evil. That means you're planning to forgive them. I know you. That's, that's what he's saying in the verse. He says, let me die now. This is it. This is too much humiliation for me. Jonah was also concerned that now his message of destruction to the city of Nineveh, which now did not come about, would mean that he was a false prophets add insult to injury not only is he upset that they get to live but now he looks like the fool because he told them they were going to be destroyed and now they're not going to be destroyed so he tells God just let me die this is why I ran away this is why I didn't want to do this Jonah's sense of right and wrong Jonah's sense of justice was not God's sense of justice this is the key and this is really the heart of this story Jonah would have been happy to see these people wiped from the face of the earth rather than be forgiven and rather than receive life. So when they repent, 
He gets depressed and he gets angry. A revival in the city and a prophet of God is angry and suicidal as a result. Very telling component because this is something that we can relate to as well. How is our heart towards those that God loves but to not fit our picture of deserving salvation? How do we feel about those that might be so much worse than us when it comes to God's forgiveness and love and acceptance of them? This is what Jonah struggled with. After all, Jonah was an Israelite, a prophet of God, a worshiper of the true God. They had the truth. These Ninevites did not deserve any good. And yet we see in this story that Jonah behaved and acted just like the Ninevites. And God was trying to show Jonah what was really in his heart. Are you angry at God's grace towards those that you feel are undeserving? That's what Jonah was like. He did not want these people, he did not feel they deserved life or forgiveness or grace. And when God gave them grace and mercy and forgiveness, Jonah got angry and he told God, I knew you'd do this. So the question then, and this is what I want to look at briefly as well. If you look at the message that God gave to Jonah to preach to the Ninevites, was that he would go cry against them. Or that he would warn them of destruction. As a matter of fact, if you look at his preaching, he, will, he told them that in 40 days, they will be destroyed. The city and all the inhabitants will be destroyed. If you look, and you don't have to look carefully, if you read the story, you'll find there is nowhere in the preaching of Jonah that he actually tells the people to repent or to change anything. He basically comes to them and he preaches to them that they are going to be destroyed. You see, the nature of God's warnings is not that he sends a warning of destruction without any other option. This is a principle that even though it's not spelled out in the story of Jonah, that Jonah nonetheless recognized and understood. And this principle is recorded years later by Jeremiah. And I want to read it from Jeremiah chapter 18. And I want us to keep this point in mind because it will help us understand something as well. Jeremiah chapter 18. Like I said, this is not recorded in this detail in the story of Jonah, but it is here in Jeremiah. Jeremiah 18, beginning with verse 7. We'll just read a few verses, and you'll see straight away what the relevance of this verse is. Jonah, sorry, Jeremiah 18, verse 7. God speaking, he says, At what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom, to pluck up and to pull down and to destroy it, if that nation against whom I have pronounced turned from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. And at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it. If it do evil in my sight and it obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good wherewith I said I would benefit them. You see the principle here? God's warnings and God's blessings are dependent on an outcome. God doesn't just promise destruction like that and whatever, no matter what, you're going to get destroyed. He says, well, if they turn, then I will accept them. And if I promise a blessing and if they disobey, then it doesn't mean they'll get the blessing nonetheless. Jonah understood this principle and he was appalled that God might do just that to Nineveh. He was worried that they might hear the message of destruction and repent. God forbid that they might repent and then God forgives them and they have life. No, he did not want that to happen. He would rather die. And you know what? He ran away to Tashish and he told the people, throw me over the ship. I'd rather die than have that happen. This is the real issue and problem in the book of Jonah. Jonah's attitude towards those that he did not feel were deserving. Human nature too often. And our sense of justice is really nothing other than revenge, retribution. Even though if it's not for wrong done unto us, we kind of uh, feel it when we uh, hear about these outrageous, heinous crimes that some people commit. I don't want to, you know, relate the details of them, but in this day and age, there are some heinous, outrageous crimes committed. 
that we even sometimes feel a death sentence alone is not just enough as a punishment for that person. You know what I'm talking about? It's like they, they don't just deserve to die. They deserve to die maybe slowly. Maybe they need to suffer before they die in consequence of what they inflicted upon some poor soul. You know what I'm talking about? I don't want to get into the gory details of what might be the things that cause that. But this is to us a satisfying or satisfies our sense of justice. Many times it's retribution, revenge, even though it's not a wrong done unto us. You with me? And our sense of justice and our sense of right is not really exactly always matching up with God's sense of right and justice. And we see that very clearly in the story of Jonah. <coughs> Jonah didn't want justice for the Ninevites. He wanted them to die. And he now got worried that they were on God's mind. And he's like, oh, oh I know God. He's compassionate. He's merciful. He's going to forgive these Ninevites and use me to do it? No way. No way. So he actually goes to Nineveh. And if you look at the preaching he did in Nineveh, he preached destruction to the city with such passion and zeal. It actually woke them up to repentance. Not once in the preaching of Jonah do you find recorded that he told anyone to repent or change their ways. He actually went there and he let them have it. You people are all going to die, you heathen, miserable pagans. 40 days, you're all dead. Burn. That's what, that's what he would have preached. If you read it in the, in the story, that's what he did. For three days, he went and preached that to them. And this passion and zeal, which, which, which came from how he felt about their situation, right? Ended up causing a revival in the city. The, the message was so sharp and awakening. The king and all the nobody said, listen, we better repent. This destruction is coming. This is it. We better repent, and maybe, just maybe, God will forgive us. So they do, and God forgives them. As a matter of fact, you realize that Jonah was expecting fireworks to happen, meaning he was expect expecting the, the fire to come and destroy the city, because he finishes preaching, he says, okay, God, job done. He goes on top of the hill outside the city, and he sits to watch the destruction. Right? That's what happened. And then the destruction is not happening, so he gets angry at God. So he said, God, I told you, I knew this would happen. Let me die. He embarrassed me. Send me on a mission. Now they're going to have life, and now I'm a false prophet. I'd rather die, God. Isn't this what I told you when I was back in, at home? And I had to run to Tarshish because of this? This is Jonah's attitude. You know that that many times is our heart towards those that we feel are not as deserving as we might feel we are? Because Jonah definitely didn't feel like he was in the place of the Ninevites. He was deserving of God's approbation and mercy and grace and all these things. Even though he disobeys here and there and runs off in a ship somewhere. There are so many parallels for us. You see, our views and our ideas of salvation and those who deserve and how things should be, many times we superimpose those and expect those to be the ways that God acts and behaves. And when they are not, we actually get upset and we are disappointed because God doesn't run things the way we like or we expect. How do you view others that don't agree with your sense of being deserving? You see, we are undeserving ourselves of God's grace. You yourself are undeserving. Jonah wasn't. We are not privileged any more than any others. We're all in the same boat together. And these miserable, horrible sinners that we think of, God loves and sees us and them in the same way because we are all of the same family. That's the key here. Jonah succumbed to the national and Jewish pride and sense of being the privilege of God to the exclusion of anyone else. That's how he felt. We are God's people. These Ninevites don't deserve God's goodness like we do. And so when this mission came, for the purpose of revealing to Jonah his heart, his thinking, and teaching him this lesson, Jonah manifested what was in his heart. How is it with you? And how is it with me? The story is not as much about God's love for Nineveh, which is clear, as much as it, as it is about God's love for Jonah, his wayward child. You see, God loves the pagan, the heathen, the miserable sinner. We see that in his love for Nineveh. But God also loves and labors with his wayward, disobedient, rebellious child that knows better 
and still goes contrary to God's will. That's what this story is about. Are you like Jonah or am I like Jonah? God sees exactly where we are at and he did not give up on Jonah, thankfully, and he recorded this story or had this story recorded for us so that we can learn from it. He brought him around, he reasoned with him, he desired to teach him a lesson about himself, about his own heart, and we see that at the end of the story. God looks into your heart and he still loves you despite what might be there. The question is, will you let it go or will you hold on to it in contradiction to what God desires? Don't give up on yourself. Don't think that this is all done and over. Don't uh, give in to the idea of, I might as well die and give up seeing I've messed up already. All these things Jonah was tempted with, and yet God came through and saw him to the end. Jonah ended up acting just like the Ninevites that he despised. Do you realize that in that story? In exactly the same way. The other lesson I wanna look at we're almost there, is that even though God gave Jonah a second chance, we find that Jonah's obedience was a grudging obedience. Do you realize that? The second time Jonah came, you know, the first time he ran away, he prayed in the belly of the whale, so he goes to God says, okay, Jonah, go tell them. So he goes and tells them. And the idea you get is, okay, now Jonah lovingly and happily, joyfully, he learned his lesson. He goes on his merry way to do God's will, lesson learned. No, Jonah did that because he, his hands were tied, essentially. He did that grudgingly because he had no other choice. We see that because of what later developed in the story. He was still upset. So here's the thing. Going along with God's will and plan, with an attitude of, fine, I'll do it, can be, many times, how we act and behave. Isn't that right? We follow God's will and God's plan and God's desire because we know that's the right thing to do and we should do it, but honestly, our heart is not in it. We do it out of necessity, out of requirement, out of obligation, but really, truly, our heart is not in it. You ever felt like that? Has that ever happened to you? Here is Jonah right there. And in so doing, Jonah missed out on the joy and the blessing that is involved in that. He missed out on seeing. He was so blinded by the situation, the, the, the condition of his heart. He did not see the benefit and the blessing and the joy of a whole city of pagan, heathen people repenting and coming to the true God. He saw no joy in that whatsoever. That's a dangerous thing. And we can see that he did it grudgingly because, like I said, the way he preached in that city and his behavior afterwards shows us that he truly expected destruction and only destruction to happen to those Ninevites. So, how is your obedience today? You might say, well, I'm not like Jonah. I obey. I, I, don't, I don't rebel. I go along with, I, I, I follow. But do you follow like Jonah, grudgingly still? Or is your heart truly in it? Where is your heart? How is your obedience? How do you find your will, your place in God's will? Just out of obligation and necessity and fear of reprisal or consequence of what might happen? Because you're, you're just... You know, hands are tied and you can do no other, you might as well do it. Maybe because others see you, maybe because parents, maybe because of whatever circumstance. And you do God's will outwardly, but inwardly you are far from God's will. Don't be like Jonah. So how is your obedience today? That's the next lesson. And finally, I want to close with this point here. And this point is related to the story of Nineveh themselves. We didn't look much at Nineveh. But the beautiful thing about the God we serve, brothers and sisters, is that God accepts and forgives those that turn to Him, no matter how bad they were. The whole uh, city of Nineveh illustrates that. Like I said, Jonah was like Nineveh. Only they received the blessing that he didn't receive, right? They rejoiced, they, they, they repented, they didn't have destruction, they were happy. They rejoiced in life. You see, when God saw what they did, and the Bible tells us that they turned from their evil ways, He, re, he forgave them and He accepted them. And this is the key. When we truly repent, our ways change. 
We see that in the story of the repentance of Nineveh. Have you experienced a true and genuine repentance? Or are you repentant and still doing things the same old way as you always have? When the Ninevites repented, things took a drastic change. You see, if you are a Christian and you've never had the repentance whereby your life is actually changed and altered visibly and markedly, then perhaps you have not truly experienced the genuine, true repentance that God desires for you. And God wants that to happen. He's not, you know, this is not a message to condemn people. This is a message to invite people to come to that place. You see, God wants to have a relationship, a closeness with us, just like he had with Jonah, where he could reason with Jonah. Even Jonah was not in the place to appreciate and understand, but God did not give up on him. God wanted to take him to a deeper experience. That's what God wants for us. So if you have not recognized and realized the true genuine change that comes about from true repentance, I want to invite you to that today. Because Jonah claimed to know God, but he was angry at God. He did not enjoy the blessing of God's long-suffering towards him. And Nineveh repented and changed their ways, and God accepted them. So the prophet of God was worse off than the people of Nineveh. So this is where we are today. How is your experience? Are you like Jonah, or are you like Nineveh? Which one will you be like? Are you offended by God's grace towards those that you feel are undeserving? Or do you recognize that your heart and your condition is no better than all those who are all of the same family, the family of Adam? So the question, the challenge really of this study today is this. Where are you with God right now in your experience? Look at the story of Jonah and see the lessons and the parallels. See if you resemble Jonah in any way, or see if you have this genuine desire to repent fully and completely, like Nineveh, because God will accept you. God wants you to enjoy doing His will. God is not happy when you carry out His will grudgingly, and, and just it's not like God gets joy out of that. Just do what I want, you know? Sometimes with the children that happens, but God is not like that. You know, just do what I say. Just do it. Sometimes I do it grudgingly. Oh, it's done. Okay, good. I wanted that to happen. God is so much more than how we are. The Bible actually tells us that. So, how are you living now? Where are you at? God sees your life. God sees your heart. He knows what is going on. If you're challenged, you have difficulty, you have trial, whatever it might be. God is seeking to restore you completely to Him. Don't give up on yourself. Even if others might give up on you, whatever your circumstance. Jonah was restored and not given up on by God. So, God is calling us to this deep repentance. That's the invitation I want to give to you today. Will you heed it? Or will you keep running in the ship? Or whatever it is that you are running away in. Amen? Amen. I pray you were blessed by this video. Be sure to subscribe to our channel, like, turn notifications on, and most importantly, share this video with others. May God the Father richly bless you in Jesus.